So today I want to talk to you about the Sermon on the Mount. I do this about every two or three years. Um, and I want to talk to you about it because here's what I've come to discover. Many, 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 if not, I would say the vast majority of Christians, they have been convinced that the Sermon on the Mount is sort of the goal for Christians. It's the, hey, let's all try really hard, do our very best to achieve what Jesus is talking about on the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe using scripture word for word that we can go through just, we're just going to look at uh, Matthew chapter five today, but I believe we can go through this and you'll come away with two things. Number one, this message is not to Christians. This message is to Jewish people who are chasing after the law. They are not chasing after Jesus, at least at this point. And it's also about the law. And what, what do I mean by the law? It's about Jesus having a heart for Jewish people and wanting them to be saved. And how is he doing this? How does the Sermon on the Mount come into play with this? And here's how. The Sermon on the Mount is an opportunity to have all of these Jewish people sitting in a circle hearing what they think is going to be a warm and fuzzy message from Jesus, right? And all of a sudden, Jesus is going to start talking about the law. And all of a sudden, they're going to realize the real standard of the law is so much more than they believe. And what's the point behind this? Because we know from Scripture, no one, no one, hear me, no one will be found righteous through the law. So if these Jewish people are chasing after the law for righteousness, and no one will be found righteous through the law, it shouldn't be that difficult to consider that the Sermon on the Mount, the goal Jesus had was to what? To save them. How do you save people who are chasing after the law for righteousness? You show them the true standard of it. You have them look at it in its perfect glory and perfection and say, who can do this? No one can do this. It's not even possible. Now, some will argue, no, that's not just to Jewish people under the law, that this is also just written to everyday Christians. And I think we can very easily illustrate that it's not, in fact, written to uh, Christians. So before we go into uh, Matthew chapter 5, I just want to read a few verses for you to consider as a framework about my view on the law. Because you've got a lot of, I don't know if they mean well, if they're wolves in sheep clothing, or, and I'm sure in some cases, they're just deeply confused because they haven't been brought up like that. You know these people, right? Like, you better keep the law. If you don't keep the law, you're going to hell. And these will be the people that are really, really misteaching the Sermon on the Mount. But let's not take my view on the law. I want to say this first before I read a couple verses about the law so we can put legs on what I'm about to say. The law is perfect. The law is holy. The law in its it is so glorious. You are in a world of trouble if you are under the law. So we're not talking about the law not existing, the law not being awesome, the law not being perfect and holy. We're talking about the heart of Christ for you to not be under a system that is so perfect and so holy that really it's its intent was really for one thing, to point its finger in your face and say, you aren't qualified to be saved on your own, meaning you need a better system. You need one that's founded on better hopes and better promises, and that is faith apart from works of the law, believing in Jesus that whoever shall call on his name will not perish, but will receive eternal life. So let's start with this just to get some context about what God says about the law before we have some people that wanna come back and go, no, 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 you've totally misunderstood that verse. So we're going to read a couple. So we don't realize I misunderstood a verse. 
This is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses uh, 7 through 10. Apostle Paul says this. He says, but if the ministry of death engraved in letters on stones. Now, let's stop right there. What ministry was engraved in letters on stones, right? It was the Mosaic law. Now, what did he call it? It's the ministry of death. The law is a ministry of death. Again, perfect, yes, holy, yes. Why is it a ministry of death? Because no one will ever be found righteous through the law. It's not, well, just do your best and then confess and repent and ask for forgiveness and then it's okay. No, no. That is garbage teaching and it waters down the true standard of the law. Yeah, you don't really have to keep the law. You just got to really try your best that you can, confess and repent. That's not what the scripture says. But he says, if, if this ministry of death engraved in letters on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses. So again, we know it's Moses because the glory of his face fading as it was, how the men, uh, how will the ministry of the spirit, this is the new covenant, right? This is faith, right? This is believing and knowing Jesus for salvation. For the ministry of, con um, how will the ministry of the spirit fail to be even I'm sorry, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For the ministry of condemnation has glory, right? We're, you got people out there just, oh, the law, the law, the law. And the point is, if the ministry of condemnation and death had glory, has glory, how much more does the ministry of righteousness excel in glory? Meaning it is a competition. The Mosaic law is one covenant and the other one is Christ, faith. Which ministry is greater? And clearly Jesus is much greater than the law. For indeed, what had glory in the case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. Romans 10, 4, for Christ, not my opinion, for Christ, if you're a Christian, Christ is the end of the law, gone, see ya, bye-bye. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. So if you believe in Christ, he is the end of the law. Now, what am I doing again? I'm laying the groundwork here. I'm laying a foundation because we're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And I want you to know what the new covenant, how it relates and translates to us being under the law. So we can read this Sermon on the Mount and realize, well, these people aren't free from the law. Christ isn't the end of the law for these people because they're under the law. And God's heart is that they won't be under the law, that they would come to know Jesus. Galatians chapter 2, 21 um, says this, it says, I do not nullify the grace of God. I don't. For if righteousness comes through the law, what's the context? Being righteous. If it comes through the law, if it were even possible, here it is, then Jesus died needlessly. Do you see it? That's the problem there. No one will be found righteous through the law. And if it were possible, then Jesus died needlessly. All right, so we're going to move now into um, Matthew chapter 5, and I want to, let's see, make sure we can, there we go. You should all be seeing my screen right now, so we're going to go over this together, and I want you to notice what happens here. We're not going to read all the beginnings, so Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So this is the beginning of the sermon. And he's talking about, I believe, Christians. And he's talking about who are people that are blessed. Now, once we get done with this, I think you're going to find, ooh, we're not so blessed then. So blessed are people. Now you ask yourself, does, does this describe people who are believers? Blessed is people who are poor in spirit, those who are mourning, those who are gentle, those who are hunger and they thirst for righteousness, people who are merciful, people who are pure in heart. To be honest, 
Do we purify our own hearts? No, our hearts are purified the moment we receive Christ and we get a new heart and a new spirit with new desires, right? Uh, blessed are uh, the peacemakers. Blessed are those, and here it is. If, if, if you even disagree at any point, read this. Blessed are those who have been persecuted, persecuted for the sake of righteousness, right? And here it is. Here's the final one that I want to read to you. Blessed are the blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Here it is because of me. So this will be people that hear the message about who Christ is and then they go sharing that message. Remember the disciples who are the ones the ones in this group that will do that. Who's going to be blessed? Well, this is going to be the disciples for sure, because this is who they are now, because they believe in Jesus. But we're going to skip down to verse 17. And what happens here is Jesus essentially says, all right, we're done talking about my disciples and who's blessed. And now I'm going to address all of you Jewish people who are not receiving me. You're chasing after the law. You, you just have so much honor and, and respect for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious elite. And I think what's going to happen here is Jesus is getting ready to crack him over the head. He's going to say, listen, you want the law? I'm going to give it to you. Like, I'm going to give it to you like you've never heard it before from any of these religious leaders because they couldn't possibly live up to it if they did. So let's start with this verse 17, right? Here he goes. He stops. He says, hey, guys, do not presume that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So the legalist gets up there and that's their go-to verse. They All the verses about the law I just read to you about Jesus being the end of the law, a ministry of condemnation and death. And they jump out at you and as if, hey, here's my home run. Um, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. So you're a heresy and you're, uh, you know, they start like trying to turn it around on you. So somehow, wow, th this is their go-to verse. But I, I want you to consider this. First of all, again, we're not saying that the law is gone. Again, remember, it's not only not gone, it's here for now. And, but if you remember the verses we read earlier, what do we know about Jesus's heart for you? and the law. You, the believer, he wants you free from the law. Jesus is the end of the law for all who believe. So why is Jesus talking about the law here? Remember, who's the audience? Unbelieving Jewish people who are chasing after the law for righteousness, right? So this message absolutely is for this audience. You want the law, I want you saved. And you're not going to get it unless I can take the standard of the law and open your eyes to the truth. Romans 7, 4 says this. It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in regards to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. What does that mean? As a Christian, we died to the law. God is calling you to die to the law. Why? Because you need to die to the law so that you may bear fruit for God. So what does that mean? If you are under the law, you can't bear fruit for God. You're bearing death, essentially. All right. Verse 19, then he says, uh, therefore, whoever nullifies one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same. Now, if we don't read this carefully, we might miss it. And teaches others to do the same. If you nullify these, even one, you're going to be called the least of the kingdom, least in the kingdom of heaven, right? So let's stop there. Are we saying 
that we're nullifying the commandments. Absolutely not. The law is still here today. But remember, there's a group of people under the law. They're called unbelievers. So we don't dare say, oh, the law's gone. That's foolishness. But there's another group of people who are not under the law. We've been saved by grace, sins taken away, paid for on the cross, right? Two groups of people, one law, it impacts us differently, but we have died to the law. And then catch this one, huh? Here it comes. They love this verse, but whoever keeps and teaches them, teaches what is them? It's the law. Whoever keeps the law and teaches the law, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Boy, you have people that will build an entire theology out of this. So you got to do your best. You got to be your best. The goal is like Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. If you teach these laws and you keep them yourself, you're going to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's how you get into the kingdom. And that's how you become great. They've missed the context totally. Again, who's the audience to? It's Jewish people who are unbelieving. It is true, by the way. Let me say this. What Jesus said to these Jewish people in verse 19. Yes, it is true. If you keep the law, you will be called righteous in heaven. But what we learn from the scripture is that not one person can do it. Romans 3.20 says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. You hear it? Now contrast that, Romans 3.20, no one's going to be found righteous. Hey, all you Jewish people here, uh, here at the Sermon on the Mount, not one of you will be found righteous in my Father's sight by works of the law. But wait a minute, Jesus, you just said anyone who keeps the law is going to be called great in heaven. Do you see it, folks? We, we miss it sometimes. What's the heart of Jesus? To lead them to Christ, to lead them to believe in him through faith, to look at the law and say, this is a problem. Jesus um, has just laid the foundation to these Jewish people. Um, and they should feel like we, we've got a problem here with what Jesus is saying. Now, remember, what are the Jewish people chasing after? I'm not trying to be redundant, but I really want everyone to walk away from today's video saying, I get the Sermon on the Mount now. Are they chasing after Jesus? Do they believe that he's the Messiah? Not talking about the disciples. I'm talking about the crowd in general. Or are they chasing after the law? Because if they're not chasing after the law, why is Jesus even going through it? Because he's really getting ready to take this law and he's just going to dump it over their heads. They're going to be buried in it. Literally, it'll be over their necks, actually, over their heads. And we know that um, we know that the law has not been abolished. And we know either one or the other, you need to be able to perfectly keep the law so you can be called great in heaven, or you need a system that is founded on better hopes and better promises. One that is not about you. A lot of people don't catch this, by the way. The new covenant, old covenant was man and God. God and man say, we will do everything in the, in the commandments, Father. And God says, okay, you do everything in the covenant, then you'll be rescued, right? But they couldn't. The new covenant is really weird. A lot of people think, yeah, you got it, you got it, you better, you better, you better. You can't do this. You better not do that. By the way, it would be true to say we should not do many of these things, but you better not, you cannot or else. I'd say, no, we, we miss it. The new covenant is not a promise between men, women, humans, and God. God could swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself. Because by two unchangeable things, God cannot lie. So God promised himself, when you're faithless, he's going to remain faithful. Your role is to believe. It is not to keep the commandments. Yes, don't lie. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. But your role when it comes to your salvation is not tied even this much to the law. 
It has zero to do with the law. Your role is to believe in what Jesus said he has done. Remember, the scripture says that whoever keeps the entire law, this is the apostle James, if you keep all of the law, but if you stumble at one point, you are guilty of it all. Maybe you looked one time with lust. Maybe you got drunk one Saturday night. Maybe you said a curse word. Maybe you were disobedient to parents. Guys, there's we've all, we've all stumbled at one point. And James says, well, if you kept it all perfect, this is the strict apostle, right? Yeah, if you kept it all perfectly and you made one mistake, it doesn't matter if it's one or one million, you're done. You're fried. You're hellbound under the law. And again, what should that make you say and me say? That should make us say, well, come on. That's a little harsh, don't you think? No, no, no. We're allowed to stumble. All we have to do is say, I'm sorry and really mean it and then repent from it and confess it. And then God's going to take it all away. That's how it activates forgiveness. No, that's not the truth. You are either fully forgiven in Christ, safe, no matter how many dumb choices you make, or you're under the law. And if you stumble at one point, you're guilty of it all. There is no system in which the goal is you can stumble, but all you have to do is confess, agree with God, turn from it, and never do it again. That's baloney teaching, okay? All right, so where are we at now? Um, verse, anyway, it's back to 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever nullifies at least, at least of these commandments teaches others to do the same, they shall be, uh, the, 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 the least of these commands, uh, the, and teaches them to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom. My apologies, guys. I'm getting a little lost here. Verse 20 says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. Verse 21, by the way, let's stop right there. The Pharisees, how the scribes, how righteous were these people considered? By the way, he's talking about their perception, the audience's perception of these people, right? They look at these people as, oh, they've got direct access to God and they're just amazing. And they're like the leaders and they're without sin. They're so perfect and so awesome. And he's saying to them, yeah, you don't even have to be like them. That's not even enough. You have to surpass it. And unless you can actually do even more than them, well, you're not going to inherit the kingdom. And here's a newsflash. If you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus. You've already surpassed them. You far surpassed them. Because our righteousness is not about what we do. It's about who we're in. Dead in Adam, under the law, or alive in Christ through faith. Right? So then we get to uh, verse 21. He says, you have heard, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not murder. Where do you think they heard that? Well, they heard it from the Mosaic law. So again, there's no getting around this. This whole thing is about people under the law. And we are not under the law. We're free from the law. Christ is the end of the law. I really got to make sure that sinks in. So you go, ah, oh, this sermon isn't for me. Yeah, let's avoid sin. Let's not lie, cheat, steal, and commit adultery. But this sermon is not for you. This sermon is for people who are not in Christ. And it comes with a threat hurled right at your face. It says to everyone under the law, everyone in this audience is being basically told, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. Because Jesus is going to unpack the law and show it's so perfect that there's not one person under his voice, aside from people who are in Christ, one person who's under the law that will see the kingdom. They are all doomed for eternal punishment in hell. And it's high time we stop pushing this message as a, you got to do it. This is this is the Christian life. It's not the Christian life. The Christian life is knowing Jesus, not trying to perfect the law. So you've heard it, uh, that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. What kind of court is this? This is a Jewish court, right? It's not a Gentile court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court, right? And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, 
shall be answerable to the Supreme Court. Whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now read those carefully. Angry? Ever been angry with a brother? I mean, didn't say anything about unless you just, you know, confess it and, and, and repent of it, right? Get it all right. Get on your knees. Never do it again, um, right? Just ask for forgiveness. That's not in here. If you've been angry with a brother, hell, call somebody a fool? You ever called somebody a fool? Let's be honest. You can take that deeper. An idiot, a jerk, smart mouth. We can go on and on and on. At some time, you ever called somebody a name that would be in lines with calling them a fool? You get hell. Oh, you didn't say 10 times, 20 times, or not repenting of it. If you've done it, this is the standard of the law. Angry with another Christian? Hell. Calling another Christian a name? Hell, right? There, this The whole message here is under law, everybody gets hell. No one is found righteous through the law. The life under the law, or life under the law, it's total perfection. You get 0% or 100%. You stumble one time or zero because one time is the equivalent of stumbling a gazillion times, right? It's an all or nothing proposition. The law gives no wiggle room. The law does not allow you to say, dear God, I'm really sorry I did that. I've asked and I'm confessing that I did it and I'm just not going to do it anymore. The law says, I, I don't care that you asked and that you confessed and that you're repenting of it. No, you get hell. Whoever keeps the entire law and stumbles at one point is guilty of it all. The law does not meet you in the middle, right? Okay, so let's continue on. Verse 23 says, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, keep an eye on that word, the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and present your offering. An altar. An altar is a place for Jewish people. It's where they had their animal sacrifices. Um, there's nowhere in scripture. Literally, you can read all of scripture and you're not going to see non-Jewish people hanging out at an altar. I've always thought it was weird. It doesn't bother me. I've always thought it was weird that we have an altar in our Christian churches today. I'm like, Oh, what are we going to do? Bring up some bulls and goats and start cutting them up and shedding their blood? I mean, an altar is a Jewish system. I mean, we're going up to the altar to pray like the spirit of God lives in you. This idea that walking up to a, uh, an altar at the front of the church somehow makes us more godly, gets us more forgiveness. I don't know what we think that does. You can pray sitting in your chair in the congregation. And you've got every much as forgiveness as the guy who runs down the aisle and he's bending over at the uh, altar and, oh, please, please. Like, I, I think sometimes people miss that. I'm like, wow, I think it's almost, it's not if you're a Christian, but if you're not a Christian, it's an, it's an insult if you're claiming Jesus and you're hanging out at an altar. I know most people do it because they, they I, 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 obviously most churches think that an altar is some sacred thing to have at a church, but I'm just saying, you don't see people even in the Bible running down an aisle, even just to, you know, hey, raise your hand, say you believe in Jesus, and then come on down in front of the aisle. Like you can sit right in your chair and just say to yourself, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah and you'll be saved. So I don't want to go too deep into altars. I don't really want to honestly have a whole lot of commentary or defend it. That's just my personal view. If you want to go to an altar, I think it's perfectly fine. Again, he says in verse 24, leave your offering there uh, before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So he's like, don't even go to the altar, right? Just run out. If you got a, if you got a Christian that you're offended with, I don't even want your tithe. Don't even come here uh, with your gift or your offering or whatever it is. You, you got a brother out there that's offended. You're offended. You need to get that straight first. Again, life under law. So verse 25, he says, you know, come to good terms with your accuser quickly uh, while you're with him on the way to court so that your accuser will not hand you over to the judge and judge the officer and you will be will not be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come uh, out there until you have paid the last 
quadrants. Verse 27, he says, you've heard it said, and remember, where did they hear this stuff? He's, they're quoting the Mosaic law. So again, I don't think anybody who is intellectually honest with themselves is denying that this is Jewish people, that there's law, and that the bigger thing is that, well, are we addressing an unbelieving group of Jewish people or a believing group of people? And again, why would, it, especially if you don't believe in sal uh, losing salvation, which that is the biggest lie, they're the biggest cult, it's the biggest deception, I think, on the planet it's just garbage teaching. But if you don't believe that we can lose salvation, yeah, I believe once saved, always saved, because the blood of Christ is a whole lot bigger than my short callings. Um, but they continue to threaten hell for these people. In the messages, all of these people are heading that direction already. So you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I want you to imagine there you are at the Sermon on the Mount. Every man and probably most women thought, wait a minute. You know, Jesus, you were doing okay. Then you're telling me if I've been mad at a brother, you're telling me if I look with lust, if I called somebody a name, like Jesus is just literally destroyed all their hopes and dreams of ever seeing God, right? He's telling them that this is really what the standard of the law is. You think it's don't commit adultery. And it is. But I'm telling you, adultery isn't the physical act. All you need to do is look with lust. And you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Now, I notice it says with her, probably because it's probably men by far guilty of this. Um, but there's no woman walking out of this uh, this sermon feeling like she's safe, for sure. Um, it's all of us. So now if your right eye causes you to sin, and I don't know about you, but it's just my left eye. It's not a big deal. <laughs> but if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away from you. Yeah, not doing that. Uh, for it's better for you to lose one of your body parts. Can it be the big toe or something? I'm like, I, <laughs> now if your right eye causes you to do this, throw it away. It's better to lose one, uh, one of your body parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body then your whole body go into hell. Now, to be clear, this isn't some hyperbole or some, you know, Jesus is just trying to make you think. No, if you're under the law, if your eye causes you to sin, it causes, it has now caused you to commit, to look with lust. That means you've committed adultery. That means the punishment is hell. Remember, one stumble at one point, you're guilty of it all. Jesus is saying, hey, dude, it's really this simple under law. You look, eye causes you to do it. You've sinned already. You're hell bound. You should have cut your eye. You should have cut your eye out before you had a chance to look with lust. Same thing with your hands. So again, is this a message you really want for you? And if we go through all of the Sermon on the Mount, no one walks away feeling like, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. Every intellectually honest Christian says, no, thank you. Man, that sounded good coming from my preacher at the local church pushing it. Do your best. Try your best. And we'll all be happy. We'll confess when we mess up and say, I'm sorry, and we'll stop doing it. And all is good. That is a very, very watered down, matter of fact, hype, a super muddied up version of the Sermon on the Mount. And it means they missed what Jesus is trying to do. Again, is everything Jesus says true? Yes if you understand who he's saying it to and why. We're not discrediting the words of Jesus. The argument here is who is he saying them to? And it does matter. Jesus is gonna have a very different message for an unbeliever under the law than a Christian who is free from the law. Verse 31 says, now it was said, whoever sends his wife away to give her a certificate of divorce. Um, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for uh, the reason of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman um, commits adultery. Yeah, I know this verse is used by, I think I would call them untrained Christians, to, to suggest that if you have been divorced, 
and you've remarried or you've married a divorced person. Oh, you're an adulterer. Better get out of the church. Can't serve in church. Can't be anything. Can't can't love Jesus. Can't have anything to do with God because you married someone else and you used to be married. What does the scripture teach us about that? See, adulterer is an identity. If you're under the law, everyone is adulterer and adulterer. You've looked with lust. It's all of us. But wait a minute. If I've committed adultery, remember the woman who committed adultery, right? Jesus lifts her up. And she did like five times. Jesus says, who condemns you? She says, no. And he says, nor do I. Of course, they're like, well, Jesus said, go and send no more. And I would say, well, of course. He doesn't want her to commit adultery again. But if she did again, what would he do? He would grab her by the hand and say, who condemns you? Nor do I. Now go and sin no more. I love you. Don't do this. This is terrible. You're better than this. It's not a threat. Go and sin no more. It's I love you. I don't want you to sin anymore. But then you have the religious egotistical Pharisee, right? He's being told if you look with lust, you're guilty. You get hell. Wait a minute. I look with lust. I'm, you know, I'm under the law. I look with lust. I get hell. This woman who receives me did it five times and you tell her she's not condemned? What? In other words, what are we seeing here? There's This is the difference in law and a new covenant saved by grace through faith. Thus anyone boast, it's not of ourselves. It's not of us avoiding adultery, uh, not of us avoiding looking with lust. There are two kinds of covenants. One is the path is easy. The other one, path is wide and everyone's going for it. It looks, it's a, it's a destructive path. And all these Jewish people are going through it because they think the way to life is through human effort, through the law. And Jesus, again, is crushing them. I mean, he is crushing them over this thinking. All right, we're going to, we're nearing done here. He says, again, you've heard it, uh, that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, don't lie but you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, uh, take no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, uh, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for, the, uh, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you take an oath by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black, but make sure your statement is yes, yes or no, no, anything beyond these is evil of origin. We're hitting in verse 38 now. It says, you have heard it said, eye for an eye. Now, listen to this very carefully. Imagine, all right, I am saying this to you. You're in the audience, not me. Gee, I'm reading it to you. Jesus is here. And you guys are all in the audience. And Jesus looks at you and he says this to you. Now, look, y'all read the Bible. And I know it says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not show opposition to any evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, just turn the other one toward him, right? Now imagine this. There's an evil person. He wants to take total advantage of you, slaps you in your face. You need to be a doormat. Do nothing. I'm telling you, commanding you, Jesus is saying, do nothing. This is the law. You let them slap you on their face and you turn the other cheek. No matter how much you don't like him, no matter how evil he is, no matter what he did to you, deal with it. Um, verse 40 says, and if anyone, sorry, I'm going to just catch this. Oh, and if anyone wants to sue you, take your tunic, let him also have your cloak also. So don't fight back, right? Doesn't matter who's suing you, just give up. Give them everything. That's what you're being commanded to do. Lose your business lose your house, lose the ability to take care of your wife and kids. If they sue you, just give it to them. Oh, I'm sure somebody out there has a way of watering this down, but if you can't tell me I misunderstood every single verse in the entire Sermon on the Mount, because every one of these, every verse in Sermon on the Mount is in your face, and it's telling you, you get hell. If you can't be totally perfect, now, if you don't see the message here is be perfect, you can't mess up at all. You must be without mistake, without error, without sin. Verse 41, whoever forces you to go on one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks. Here, now, here it comes. 
You guys need to give to everyone who asks of you. I would like you to give me $5,000. If you don't have $5,000, please send me half of everything you own. Message me and I'll give you my address so you can send it. I mean, come on, give to me. I'm asking of you. And do not turn away anyone from anyone who wants to borrow from you. Can you imagine how many people would want to borrow from you that would not pay it back if every Christian were actually living up to this? Is that really how you think we're going to inherit the kingdom? Let everybody ask us for whatever they want. We give it to them. Hey, can I get your lawnmower? Sure. Can I get your car? Sure. Hey, can I borrow a thousand dollars? Sure. But are you going to take my lawnmower, my car and go somewhere and not come back? Verse 43, for you've heard it said, you will love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he causes us, uh, his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I'm going to stop there for a minute. You need to love your enemy. Sounds easy, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, me, I'm awesome. I love my enemies. Okay, let's consider for a minute that this enemy has sexually abused someone in your family. And I'm not trying to be funny when I say this. This is not a funny, that's not a funny matter at all. Happens a lot. Could you just love that person unconditionally? Now he wants to borrow money from you. Okay, let's say, I don't know, there are pedophiles out there that do some very sexually abused various people. There are rapists out there. There are murderers out there. If they did that to someone in your family, could you just love them? Could you just blindly love them and then give them money on top of that. Give them your car. Let them sue you even stuff. Like, do you see what's how, how impossible this is? What's it supposed to do? And again, it's supposed to lead us to seek out. And how do we do it? We seek out another system. Verse 46, we're nearing the end finally. It says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, do they not do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Check this out. Even the Gentiles, do they not do the same? If this isn't just being written to Jewish people, then why would you say even those Gentiles? You know, hey, you Jew, even those dirty Gentiles, who, by the way, have not they're not being invited to the table yet. This is later to come. Uh, so they're not saved through faith at this point. Jesus hasn't even gone to the cross. And he says, even the Gentiles, you know, the non a Gentile is a non-Jewish person. Do they not do the same? And here's the hardest one. It sums it all up. Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Perfect, just as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, I want to ask you to consider for a moment. Can anyone be perfect like God is? What God is described here in Matthew chapter five is total perfection. You don't get to stumble at one point. You don't get to call people names. You got to give away to people who ask or people who want to borrow or just, just want your stuff. Can't You can't call them a fool. You can't look with lust, right? You can't be like it, the law. It, I, I wish more Christians would stop pushing this and realize the law was never intended to be our guideline for living. Yeah, I need the law. I need the law. I need a rule to tell me what I can and can't do. How about we let Jesus tell us what we can and cannot do? In closing, I really shared this message today because I had several friends and followers and uh, people who are on the channel uh, who are struggling with something in their lives. And then they point to things like the Sermon on the Mount saying, yeah, but oh my gosh, I feel like God can't forgive me the struggle um, and he's talking about cut out my eye and cut off my hand. And it, people naturally feel like, okay, that's how serious this stuff is. And it really is that serious if you're under law. So the takeaway once again is that these indeed are Jewish people. They're under the law. They've been chasing after self-righteousness through a set of rules. Jesus has taken the standard of the law and he's brought it way up here and said, this is what it really looks like. You heard it was like this, 
But I tell you, it's like this. And here's the reality. You are all doomed if that is the system you are chasing after. You are completely and totally doomed. And my heart, as, as Jesus would say, is that you would be free from the law, that you would be dead to the law so you can bear fruit for me. And I am the end of the law for everyone who believes. And if you're a believer in Christ, the good news is this. Even if you bought into this theology of the law, you're free from the law. <laughs> you're just living like a miserable person because you're trying to chase after a system that God's heart is for you to be free from. All right, that's today's message, guys. As always, if you enjoyed that, I hope you will like, comment, and share below. God bless you.